Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight for the Q&A for the film Picture of His Life. My name is Judy Laster. I'm the director of the Woods Hole Film Festival. And this year we are celebrating our 29th year as the Woods Hole Film Festival. Uh, generally, the festival takes place as an eight day in-person event in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. But this year, as you well know, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, about two and a half months ago, we decided that if we were gonna be able to have the festival, we would have to change it up and have an all virtual film festival. So basically we had, I like to say two and a half to three months to essentially create something like Netflix without any investment capital and with like five or six people working around the clock to make it happen. But we're thrilled that we were able to do it and to be able to present the amazing work of the filmmakers whose work we're showing over these eight days. We have 187 films that we selected from submissions sent to us from around the world. And if you haven't had a chance to log into the platform yet and see the films uh, you have until August 1st, uh, the platform is available 24 hours a day. And I suggest that you take 24 hours a day to watch the 187 films that we have because you will truly be amazed at the breadth and depth of work that is being created this uh, now by emerging independent filmmakers from around the world. Uh, this year, the festival has many firsts. We have world premieres of a number of films, New England and Massachusetts premieres. And we have many films uh, because we are located in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, that um, focus on environmental and ocean and climate issues. And this film is one of them and we're so thrilled to have it here. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. I would like to um, remind everybody that this festival and every other film festival can't happen without the support of sponsors and grant funders and donors. And this particular screening um, is sponsored by Mark DeNoia um, Remax. And with us this evening also is Miriam Wasser, who is a journalist with WBUR, um, the Boston NPR station. And Miriam is going to be the person who's going to be speaking with Donnie Mankin, who is one of the co-filmmakers who made the film Picture of His Life. So we're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then open it up for questions. Uh, if you can write your questions in the chat, we will try and get to them. We may not be able to get to all of them, but we will certainly try. And uh, so without further ado, thank you and welcome. And Miriam, please um, chime right in here. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Judy, for that introduction. And Donnie, if you want to turn on your video so the world can see you too. Um, fantastic film that we all just watched. Um, Donnie, my first question for you would be, how did you come across uh, Emma's story and what drew you to it? I'm trying to uh, put the camera on, but maybe it's something someone on the back uh, uh, office over there can uh, confirm me, but do you guys hear me well? We can hear you, yeah. That's All what's right. important. It says, unable to start or start my video. All right, should be now. All right. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'm alive. Yeah, so we, uh, we have actually made the Jonathan and I if another film called Dolphin Boy, and it was about um, uh, released uh, seven years ago. It was very successful. I made another film called 39 Pounds of Love that was on HBO. It was a road trip film. When I finished that movie, I was approached by a studio in Israel uh, telling me about Amos and his journey and his story. Uh, back then, uh, I could not believe that this film can be made with normal documentary budget. And when Jonathan and I, actually I met Jonathan through Amos, because Jonathan was working with Amos at the time, uh, worked on Dolphin Boy together, and it was such a big success, we have decided that we're going to revisit the, the original story that we wanted to do in the story of Amos, and the journey that he takes to take the ultimate picture for him, which is a polar bear underwater. Now, we're not going to tell you if he succeeded or not, 
those who've seen the film know what happened. But for us, it was important not only to tell the story of the journey to take the picture, but also the behind the scene of who Amos is as a person. So we were interested in the personal story of Amos. Great. And I'm sorry, I should have, I should have mentioned the fact that Yonatan is your co-producer and he could not join us tonight in what is perhaps the ultimate sign of the times. It sounds as though he is ill. Um, so we wish him Yonatan, Yonatan is my co-creator and uh, it's uh, 4 a.m. now in Israel. And like so many others, he and his family also got... Uh, tested for COVID, so they are cautious, they are careful, but they are going to be fine. Yes. Okay, well, good. And we hope he's sleeping well right now. So um, my next question, I'm just curious, what did people in your life say to you when, you when you came to them and said you were making a film about a photographer setting out to swim with one of the world's most dangerous predators, and that that would involve you going out there as well. Yeah, so the first thing people always told us is grizzly men. You know, oh my gosh, are you guys about to do another grizzly man? And we explained to them, no, it's not grizzly man. You wanna quickly explain what grizzly man is for those who may not? Yeah, it's a great yeah. film of Werner Herzog, our colleague, and it's uh, a story that he followed a photographer that lived alongside with a grizzly bear. <laughs> And it didn't end up so well, uh, without making spoilers to those of you who want to see that film. I will tell you that for all of you who want to see our movie, it ends up uh, uh, better. But uh, we, uh, we heard that a lot. You know, what do you mean? Are you crazy? Why are you doing this? And, uh, but, but we were very passionate about a going to the Arctic and also opening Amos, not only opening him about the journey, which is fascinating, of course, obviously, but we're also interested in why the hell he wants to do that. Who is that man behind the image? And um, what is his message? Because obviously we felt like this is almost stronger than him. He has to do it. And he wants to do it in this environment. So we wanted to know what his, his environmental message, what is his uh, transformational as a character, which makes the movie a movie, and, uh, and the backstory. Um, he was a soldier in the Israeli army, and he saw people killing. He may have killed people, and, uh, and he grew up in, in the 50s with a very tough uh, father that did not believe in him. So all of that scope uh, was integrated into our, let's call it, uh, from lack of a better word, script. Because people say, oh, documentary, you don't have a script. Yo, you do. You put it together, it's a script. So we put it all together, and uh, that's how a picture of his life came about. And we're very, very happy with it. Yeah, it was a, it was a great film. Um, that actually leads perfectly into my next question, which is that as I was watching this, I started hearing from the different people you interviewed a variety of theories about why he was doing what he was doing. And I took out my pen and paper and started writing them down. And by the end of the movie, I came up with seven distinct reasons why people said he was doing what he's doing. And I'd love to quickly go through those with you and then hear your theory and hear maybe how that's changed over time. So the first one was that he sees his father in the polar bear and he wants to be at peace with, with the relationship he has with him or he wanted to prove something. The second was that he wanted to stay relevant as an, art of it, or as an artist, excuse me. Um, the third was that the polar bear had eluded him once before and he refused to let it win again. There was sort of a climate change angle to it that you know sea ice is melting and polar bears are endangered and he wanted to photograph them before they're gone. Another was that he wanted to prove that humans can live in harmony with large predators. Um, the next was that he's addicted to adrenaline and that, that might possibly related, be related to his military background. Mm -hmm. 
relatedly, um, that the trauma he experienced during the Yom Kippur War was so awful that he has spent his life in pursuit of things that are beautiful and magnificent. So again, I'm curious what your theory of this is. Why, why did he have to take this photo? And did your theory of that change over time as you were making the movie? So it's a great question. And the answer, the short answer is yes, it did change on time. And I believe all those answers are true. When you do things in life, and I'm, I'm being philosophical a little bit, but when you do things in life, there is not only one reason why you do that. That's very simply uh, simple. But I was fascinated by the fact that Amos did not have a family. I mean, when we made Dolphin Boy, Jonathan and I started to have a family, each one from a different woman. <laughs> but but we, 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 we felt, you know, and, and why do you have a family? Why? Do you go and have kids? Is it one reason? It's really, you really want to give, you want to have a next generation. So almost I felt like that was Amos' legacy. He wanted to do it. And why is it? Is it the engine that came out from the father that never believed that he can be something? Is it the post-trauma from the Israeli army that transformed himself from being a soldier in the Israeli army to now a soldier of mother nature, in his words? Is it because he wants to be relevant at almost the age of uh, 70, still doing what he does? Is it because he has no family and maybe the polar bear and mother nature is his family? Or maybe you want to show um, everyone that, um, you know, polar bear who symbolized now um, the climate crisis, and can live in harmony with humans and, and, and look what we're doing to, uh, to the polar bear. And we heard it from Sylvia Earle and we heard uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau giving his theory about it. So I think all of those things, we, we just wanted to put all of those um, answers together and let the audience decide what does he want to take. So there's not just one answer for all of them and, and and it's true that for us you know we we have changed our answer from time to time you know and and uh, and that's the fun thing about making a documentary about somebody who's complex is not one dimension is <laughs> so many layers to him and that's what i think makes him such a fascinating character totally agree and I thought it was interesting that so much of the narration came from people in his life, um, particularly his underwater videographer friend, Adam, who was also out there with you guys. Um, and in some ways, the construction reminded me of how a journalist might tell a story when the central character is unwilling or unable to participate. Um, obviously, almost did participate in this film, and you have a number of really poignant scenes with him where he's he's talking to you about climate change and about um, PTSD and, and a number of different things. But I'm curious, what, what made you tell the story this way? Was he just a quieter person? And so it, it made sense to talk to others? Um, how, how, why did you go about making scripting it the way that you did? Yeah, so it just took us a long time to really open him up and to go to what we felt is the Amos that we wanted to show. We were not interested in being um, uh, our, his tour guides. So when he spoke to us at the beginning, we were like his tour guides. Oh, you see, I'm going here, and now you see here, and this way. And we were not interested in this. We wanted to capture his story, and, and it was really when he was in his element, which was in the Arctic, that Jonathan and I felt, you know what, where we got to him. And maybe it has to do a little bit with his trauma, with his uh, challenge in trusting humans after all he has been through in his life. And he trusts more um, animals and he wants to live in harmony with them, but it's 
challenging for him with humans. I mean, he saw a lot of terrible things. And so uh, that's why we put it all together in a way that people are telling us about him while he's not silent uh, so much. He's not talking so much in the first half of the movie. He's talking much more in the second half. But for me, he's not silent because he does express himself with his pictures. So we've see, we, we, we see tons of his pictures in the beginning. And I feel that's the best way that Amos can express himself. He's not a verbal person. He's more of a visual. That, that's, that's how he's communicating the best, in my view. Yeah. That's a, that makes total sense. Um, what was it like being up there with him? Um, and specifically, what was it like being on the boat and when he's going to photograph the, the polar bear for the first time and it's that aggressive male and we are watching him call for help saying like, this isn't gonna end well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just, I'm so curious what was going through your mind and if there was, any part of you at any point that thought, you know, maybe humans really shouldn't be up here invading these animals' space, or, or maybe we're not meant to swim together? Most of my journey over there, I was thinking uh, humans, and mostly me, should not be there. <laughs> I much rather be home, or I mean, some of my movies are about basketball. I, I come from sports, so I should be there. And uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, where, <laughs> who was that guy that took us on this private plane. Think about it, we took like six connection flights to get to the furthest point in the Arctic. And then we had to hire a private plane. And if you saw that dude that took us on this plane in, with that weather, uh, you would not go on, a, on an Uber with him. You know, so and then you're in the Arctic, you're in the Arctic and you're you're really um, worried. What if the polar bear will come? There are so many flies there. And um, so it was it was a challenge. And, and also you're you're putting it all together for Amos. I mean, Amos said that he would have done it anyway without us. So it's not like we took responsibility. God forbid if it will be a disaster. But you don't want that to happen under your watch, you know? <laughs> yeah. we, both. we were not underwater. So we knew nothing about what's going on underwater. Jonathan and I were on boat. That was going to be my next question. So all the underwater footage, it looks like it comes from like a, a drone, um, some kind of GoPro, and then also from mm. Adam? Yeah, no, very little GoPro. It was taken by Adam Ravich, the cinematographer, underwater cinematographer, and, and the stills from, uh, came from Amos. So that's it. They were underwater. We're above water with the Inuits. And yes, we were, we, we, we were terrified, you know, about, uh, about what would happen. And uh, well, I'm not sure Inuit we're, we're they, they did, I mean, you know, they obviously cheer at the end and and you all seem to get along well but i i wonder if you know while they're under water are they muttering under their breath like this is crazy this is insane or were they did they think this was a great a great uh project to embark on you're asking about about us the inuits or about no, no, you're, you're Inuit guides, the, the men no, who... Yeah, the Inuits, they said we would not be doing this, you know. Uh, they were wonderful. I mean, they were kind of like a whisper for, for polar bear. Because we, what you don't see, that we were traveling for hours and hours, and, and sometimes days, and we've seen nothing. There were no polar bear. No, thank God for editing. It was really boring. I mean, but... Uh, you know, we had to, you know, trim it for, for the sake of entertainment <laughs> and make it interesting. But most of the time we were just looking for polar bear and the Inuits, I give them a lot of credit. And we also wanted to show the different generations within the Inuits, yeah. which kind of reflects the different generation between Amos and his father. So that was part of what we've done. We, have, we had a lot of time to also write 
how do we want to structure it? So that was fun, you know, because uh, we said, oh, that's happened, that's happened. For example, I was walking and suddenly, for the first time, talking about his experience in the army and hearing the voices, that was unplanned. We were just planning to shoot B-roll of Amos walking, so we'll have that. And then, and then something like this happens, or, or, or when he suddenly cries, you know, we shot him for years and made a lot of interviews with him and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't get to his soul like, like we did over there. And, and yeah, and it was, we, we were like one big family over there. I mean, <laughs> we had to, we had to, there was nobody else. Yeah. So how much of the, the other interviews um, did you do before you went to Alaska or, I mean, to, to Canada, sorry. Or were most of the, you know, like interviews with his sisters, did that all happen before the trip or after? No, so his sister, it's interesting. Sister was part of the research that we have done, but she gave us so much insight that at some point we felt like, you know what, everything she tells us about Amos, uh, we really need it. I mean, I, I, I think putting a connection between the mission to shoot the polar bear and his personal story was kind of important because they are almost like two different movies. It's a movie about uh, about you know his personal story, his background, his army, his father, his family, and then there is this journey. So to put the link together between the polar bear and the father, which the sister was doing so well, and helped us kind of tie together those two different kind of films. Yeah, interesting. And do you, do you keep in touch with Amos? And, and how did he like the movie? How does he feel now? Does he feel at peace? Does he have uh, a project that he's going after, a new animal? Yeah, yeah. I know, so it's very interesting because we're sometimes doing even Q&A together. Before the pandemic, we've done a lot. We won uh, already seven awards and everything stopped. Uh, right now we are doing virtual cinema. So uh, whoever wants to watch the film after the festival is over, please go to pictureofhislife.com. You know, now I paid my dues. <laughs> Pictureofhislife.com and Amos is, is really is part of it and he's helping us promote it to his fans. And we, we look, we're independent. You know, it's a labor of love. You're not getting rich out of doing it. I hope you will one day, then I can do a lot of those, but you don't. It's coming from the heart. And Amos was very respectful to the way Jonathan and I wanted to uh, portray this film. For him, he wanted to do the, the adventure. But for us, we wanted to go deeper. You want to go deeper in the water? We wanted to go deeper in his personality. And so I just want to jump right in here um, just to let the audience know. If you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat and we will begin to answer them. Thanks. Yeah, so just while we're waiting for those um, questions to come in, what did he think of the final product? Because it, it, I mean, there is that adventure aspect, but it's also a, a deep probe into who he is and, and why he's doing what he's doing. Look, a, someone who's going to that kind of adventure um, has to be a fascinating person. You know, somebody who chooses a life of solitude, you know, to be a loner, not to have a family and, and just dedicate himself to mother nature and calling himself soldier of mother nature after he was a soldier in the Israeli army has to be a very fascinating character. And, you know, I have a company, a production company named Hey Jude Productions. If you want to see my other films, heyjudeproductions.com. We have more films like it, if you like those, this kind of film. But the idea is that I name it Hey Jude from the line of Paul McCartney, take a sad song and make it better. And uh, with Amos, you know, it, it's, it was very bittersweet. You know, Amos have a lot of pain in his life. And I feel like at the end of the day, when we put the song of Leonard Cohen, 
and there is that wonderful line, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. It's almost like capsule, putting capsule, like the, the feeling that we wanted to convey in, in making this film. Yeah, tell me about that last scene um, where he visits his, it's his father's grave, I assume, right? Yeah. Um, and, and puts the photograph on, on there. Was that, was that your idea? Was that his idea? Was that, how did, how did that come about? So we followed him for many years and we had uh, many discussions with his father and uh, his father was 90 years old and then he was over 90 years old. He was not in best shape. And just before we went to the Arctic, we were, Jonathan and I were in the hospital and his father was calling Amos, Amos, I love you. The first time he says all, everything he never said to him, he said to our camera. Uh, we just asked him, what do you want to tell Amos? And we were standing pretty far and he was going on and on about how he does love him. So at the end, you know, we felt because the polar bear does symbolize, um, especially the mother and two cubs, symbolize the family that his father may have wanted him to have. I felt it was like a beautiful closure to have Amos coming to his father's grave and in many ways telling him, you know what, I do have a family. It's not a normal family, it's not with kids, but it's with, uh, with polar bears, mother and two cubs. So it put, it kind of, again, it puts everything together. All the other elements were, uh, were coming together at the end of the movie. So in, in capturing that photograph, do you, I mean, you know, you would know Amos, you talk to him all the time. Does he, I mean, what does he feel towards his father now? I, I think he realizes, you know what, many times when you're making a film about somebody who has some kind of uh, trauma, and Jonathan is an expert of post-trauma, he makes a lot of films, and he also faced something like that himself. That's how also Dolphin Boy came about. Dolphin Boy is another story about uh, trauma, and whoever wants to watch this film just... Uh, reach out to us on our website, uh, heyjudeproductions.com. But it's a film that is also a love story between a father and a son. It's about a kid that was bullied and uh, recovered through the help of, um, of dolphins. And whoever will reach out to your festival, just let us know and we'll be happy to share it uh, with whoever wants to, to see this film. Um, but but I, I, I feel like Amos also went through something by looking at his whole story. You know, when you see your trauma from the outside, I think and I hope, I'm not an expert, but I hope it heals something in you. And, and Amos does say that, you know, oh, I, 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 he realizes for the first time he, he did have a post-trauma. So he does talk about it. And he never spoke about it in the movie. They never say, oh, I'm post-traumatic. No, we, we said it in, you know, in our, in, in our way. We said it, but now he does say it as well. And maybe that's what he got out of it. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I'm curious if, so obviously he gets the photograph of, of the polar bear and we have a happy ending, but it didn't, necessarily have to turn out that way and I know at least personally when I started watching it I I guess I just assumed he would and it was during that first time that he got into the water with that male bear that I suddenly thought oh my god he might not actually get this like this might be a very different movie than I think it's gonna be and I'm curious you know what was going through your head if, if when you know you're I imagine it was months in the planning to get up to, to the Arctic and, you know, going into this, did you, did you assume he would do it? And then what happened when you were encountered a moment where you thought, oh my God, he might not. So lately I'm writing screenplays. Some of them are, are based on my documentaries. 
the, the big advantage is that at least I know the ending. And yeah. when you go out to the Arctic, <laughs> or I have control on the, end, on the ending when I write my screenplays. When I go to the Arctic and, and Jonathan and I are going there or, or with Dolphin Boy or with 39 Pounds of Love, uh, the movie that I've done for uh, HBO, uh, you know, you don't know how it will end. And uh, welcome to the documentary world. You know, it, it's fascinating. It can be frightening. Uh, it's exciting also, I have to say, you know, we are, that's why we do it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very much, it's like a um, metaphor for life, you know. Do we know in life what will happen? Do you think that Amos went into this thinking that he would succeed? Or do you think there was, he, he was okay with the fact that there's a very real possibility that he wouldn't? No, uh, uh, yeah, Amos knew that like it happened to him 10 years before, this can also turn out not well. We did not know which polar bear will find us. And if at all, there were some times in, during the shooting that we said, you know, we don't have time. We don't have the budget to stay here for a long time. Everything costs a lot. We may just come back and, all right, let's think how we finish the film. Let's be creative. Who knows what? Thank God I don't need to answer that question. And the reality was different. But it's part of the risk. Amos did have a, a lot of faith that he will find the polar bear. And he, he, will he did or did not? He did. He, he had. Did. He always had. When we were like, oh my God, what are we doing? Like, why, why are we here? Where is where, where Starbucks? You know, why can't we <laughs> go have coffee somewhere? Where's the bathroom? There is no bathroom. When you go, you need to go with an Inuit with a gun. And all together, we... It's freezing, so many flies. Uh, it's, better, it's, it's better that he will succeed. <laughs> yeah. After we've done all that. And the uh, documentaries God was with us. Yeah. What did you remember, and do you remember that moment when he sort of surfaces and, and you know, he's like, I did it. Like, I got, I got the photo. And, and, I mean, I imagine there's, like, you, the filmmaker, being like, oh, thank God. And then there's you as the the person, the friend being like, oh, oh my gosh, this person just achieved this unbelievable yeah. thing. Like what, what was going through your mind? Tears, tears in our eyes. Uh, it was really tears in our eyes. I mean, uh, for me, you know, I come from the sport world. So if you are a fan of a, a basketball team and they win the championship, that's how I felt. You know, I said, yeah, we've done it. Yeah, we have the cup. You know, that's how we felt. You know, all that time, all this hustle, oh, it came together. Thank God, uh, thank God that we took a sad song and we made it better <laughs> and it ended up, ended up well. Did you, um, uh, it, almost and, and a couple other people at, at various times in the movie talk about climate change. And we know that, as you mentioned earlier, polar bears have for many years sort of been the symbol of, of climate change and of environmental destruction. I'm curious um, if any of the the Inuit people that you stayed with, if if they talked about this, or you know, I mean, presumably you're seeing climate change up front. You've got a front and center stage right there. There's only a couple of days in the year where the polar bears could have even been here because of the melting sea ice. I guess you know what what did you when you began this film? Was climate change supposed to be a big part of it? And then how did that evolve as, as you were making the movie? We knew always that there will be a chapter that talks about uh, the climate change and about the environment. Uh, it was important. And um, suddenly the United States of America elected a president that denied it. I don't know how this happened, but it happened. And, and we felt that it's even more relevant to show it firsthand. And I know that was part of why Amos wanted to do it. This film is very much non-political. And the polar bear have no idea if you're a red state or a blue state, they don't care, you're Republican, you're a Democrat. But um, it was something that uh, we knew that exists there because we also heard it from the Inuits that live there. 
you know, they told us about it. I mean, uh, what do I, I live in Los Angeles, uh, you know, so I, I hear about it in news, but when you're there and you see the ice melting and you hear from locals that it affects them and you see that the bears are weaker and you see that they're not showing up so much, you know, um, this is a great opportunity to, to put this above the surface and all that, you know, uh, we, we need to take care of them. You know, it's not going to go the other way. We need to take care of them. And, uh, and I know that this is a very important message for Amos and that's why there is that line that he's speaking about being a soldier of mother nature. Like he is, he is one of them. If he could, if he would have lived there with them, he would be part of their family. That's my theory, not his. But is he still working? Is he still taking underwater photographs? Yeah, I mean, right now nobody works and nobody travels, and and it's it's, it's uh, we're in the middle of the COVID nineteen. But yes, if you go to his website, biganimals.com, people can go and travel with him to many remote places on earth and encounter things that you would not see in, norm, in your normal day life. Wow. So Judy, I just want to make sure that we get to any audience questions. I'm not seeing any, but I don't know if you can see stuff that I can't. I don't have any, but um, if the audience doesn't ask any questions, we're going to call on them. So just mm -hmm. kidding. But audience, this is your opportunity. We have about five more minutes. Um, this is an amazing conversation, but if you want to chime in, please do so in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Um, so I know you, we've talked about COVID and the pandemic, and, and obviously things are not um, as usual, but what are you working on next? What's your next... Your, your next big movie? So for me, I'm working on turning my uh, stories into narratives. Some of them are original screenplays. Some of them are based on my documentaries, like Dolphin Boy, maybe later on, it will be a picture of his life. You can give me ideas of who can play Amos. And if it's George Clooney, Al Pacino, Al Pacino is a bit uh, over yeah, the, the, the age. I mean, uh, I, I wish him long, long uh, career. But uh, yeah, I mean, the that's kind of what I'm working on. I have made a film called On the Map, and it won many um, audience awards, like 13, and now I'm releasing the sequel for that movie, um, the story of Olsi, is an African-American guy coming to play in Israel and changing the country and himself uh, forever. Uh, so that's a film that is about to be released, and, and the picture of his life is, was supposed to be released in theatrically, but uh, we're doing the virtual cinema through our pictureofhislife.com website. So that's kind of the main thing that I'm working on. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting times, but it's also um, time to reflect, time to create, and to get ready to when everything will be back to normal or we'll be back to the new normal. <laughs> so it, it dawns on me actually just now as I'm listening to you talk that you have made two films about um, men who have experienced trauma and found some sort of healing or answers in, a connect, in their connections with animals. And I wonder if that's coincidental or if that, what what your thoughts are on that? If if you think that that elucidates a bigger truth and something that maybe many more people could benefit from? Yeah, look, I I believe that in many ways uh, a lot of people suffer from some kind of trauma. It can be bigger, it can be smaller. Even my film on the map, I portrayed a whole country that was post-traumatic from a very devastating war. So I think a lot of films are talking about that aspect. But what 
you can find in both films that I've made actually with Yonatan, Dolphin Boy and Picture of His Life are the relationship between father and son, between men and nature, and, and, and also absolutely the healing power of nature. I mean, I can tell you when I need uh, some strength and energy myself, uh, I go to the ocean, you know? So I do the same thing that my characters are doing. And, uh, and then I'm writing uh, the movies. <laughs> Yeah. And that's well, my therapy. That's why they resonate so much too, right? Yeah. There is something to yeah. that. Um, we have time for one more question. One, did we get anything in the chat? Nope, it's up to you. Okay, well, Donnie, I will end this interview the way that I always end all of my interviews, which is, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else that you want to add? Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm very thrilled. I'm, I'm honored to be part of the festival. And thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to show our, our labor of love. You know, we're really doing it because we feel we can do better for the world. And uh, whoever wants to join us or watch the film or share it with your friends, please go to pictureofhislife.com. Whoever wants to watch some of our other films, go to heyjudeproductions.com. And um, we're, we're really, I will say, a very special group of, um, or, or community of people that, you know, don't want to just sit and watch TV. We want more, and we don't need the, the fast pace, um, facing world of uh, TikTok, YouTube. <laughs> I believe there is more to it. So I still, old fa I'm old fashioned. I believe in, 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 in the movie platform and what it can do uh, to others, especially what it can do uh, to me as a, as a creator. So I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm thankful for, uh, for the opportunity and to giving us, for giving us the platform to show our films. Well, I just want to thank you, Donnie, and you, Miriam, for um, a fascinating conversation. I hope if everyone hasn't seen the film yet, uh, you have until August 1st to see it as part of the Woods Hole Film Festival and to see all of the other 186 films, 187 with this, um, that we have um, curated as part of the 29th Woods Hole Film Festival. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, creating a virtual film festival in two and a half months uh, was a whirlwind, still is a whirlwind, but I'm so thankful that we've been able to do it because all this work is just so incredible. It needs to be seen. Uh, please remember when you see it, this or every other film to vote. Um, we give jury awards and audience awards at the Woods Hole Film Festival. And we really want to support people who are creating independent film from around the world. And um, so we have a, somebody who's chiming in, says thank you so much, a great film and, and great interview. And Miriam, thank you so much. WBUR has been a longtime supporter and collaborator with the Woods Hole Film Festival. And uh, you know, we hope that we can do more together with City Space during the year and maybe visit and represent a number of the films that we have here. We would love that. We'd absolutely love that. And thank you so much, Judy, for having me. And, and Donnie, thank you so much for, for sitting for this interview. It was a really interesting conversation. That's great. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you all, and have a great night. And uh, we will see you later. Good night.